Welcome to Psychology of Learning. Um, this is another topic that was discussed in my face-to-face -face lecturing class and again if you missed it um, this is pretty much what we covered. I'm using a different slide here because my other slide um, presentation was uh, pretty exhaustive and it had some things in there that I needed to delete so I went ahead and just used my other uh, presentation but there's no difference really in the information between this one and the other one let me just say that for those of you who are looking at this and was sitting in my lecture and realizing that something's different all right so um, what is learning well learning is a relative uh, enduring change in behavior or thinking that results from experiences um, there's something called habituation uh, this is the basic form of learning evident when an organism does not respond as strongly or as often to an event uh, following multiple exposure uh, or exposes to it. And then there's a stimulus, which we'll talk more about, um, an event or occurrence that generally leads to a response. Um, for this slide, you really only need to know uh, what a stimulus is and what the definition of the definition of learning is, which is that relatively enduring change in behavior. Learning begins at birth and it continues well until death and it is not unique only to humans. It also applies to animals as well. There's three different types of learning. There's classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning. There's two different types of stimuli um, associated with uh, classical conditioning and uh, we'll look into that more um, closely. There's operant conditioning whereby connections between behaviors and consequences are made and then with observational learning this is also called cognitive learning uh, whereby learning occurs by watching and imitating others so monkey see monkey do. A notable figure uh, is Pavlov uh, when it comes to classical conditioning and in the 1890s uh, he was a physiologist that spent time studying the digestive system of dogs. Uh, he's known for winning a Nobel Prize uh, for physiology in 1904 and by complete accident uh, came across a term that he created called classical conditioning, um, something that he realized with his dogs. Now this is how classical conditioning looks. There's a neutral stimulus. Um, this is a stimulus that does not have a cause, a relevant automatic or reflexive response. Um, there's acquisition where there's the initial learning phase in both classical and operant conditioning. You'll find that in both. And then in classical conditioning itself, the learning process in which two stimuli become associated with each other when an originally neutral stimulus is conditioned to elicit an involuntary response. Well, what does all of that mean? Well, all of that uh, simply mean that um, when it is you're trying to do classical conditioning, you're going to find a couple of things going on. You'll find that there are some stimuli uh, that will elicit some type of response. And there's the unconditioned stimulus that will um, usually produce an unconditioned response. And then there's the conditioned stimulus that will produce a conditioned response. A conditioned uh, stimulus, well, matter of fact, I think I'll go ahead and start from the left. An unconditioned stimulus is a stimulus that automatically triggers an involuntary response without any learning needed. Um, a reflexive involuntary response to an unconditioned stimulus is an unconditioned response. And a conditioned stimulus, a previously neutral stimulus that an organism learns to associate with an unconditioned stimulus, and a conditioned response is a learned response to a conditioned stimulus. Now, um, to tell you what all of this means, here's an example of it. Now, when Ivan Pavlov did his experiment um, with dogs, he noticed them salivating before food was even presented. Uh, somehow the dogs had learned to associate the lab assistant approaching footsteps with eating. So they, they heard the sound of footsteps. Now when Pavlov observed this uh, discovery, um, he didn't know it was classical conditioning. He didn't really have a term for it. But he did realize that we learned to associate a neutral stimulus such as that of a bell 
with an unconditioned stimulus that produces an automatic natural response, such as dog's food. Uh, this is a, a crucial stage, um, or rather, the crucial stage of this process involves repeated pairings of the two stimuli. So before conditioning, this is what it would look like. Uh, the unconditioned stimulus would be food, and naturally uh, the dog's response would be to salivate at the sight of food. So the food, again, is the unconditioned stimulus. During conditioning, um, he would uh, pair the bell, the neutral stimulus, with the unconditioned stimulus, and then still get that response, that salivating response. Once you pair this over time, again, that crucial stage uh, that involves repeated pairings of these two stimuli, the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, over time, just the sight of the uh, neutral stimulus by itself would produce that response of salivating even without the food. In that case, the neutral stimulus becomes the conditioned stimulus, and then the um, unconditioned response becomes a conditioned response to that bell. A real-life example of this is something that naturally occurs. Uh, for us, the golden arches, you know, the first time you ever saw it, there was likely no response. Maybe you didn't know what it was. Now that you know what it is, um, what the uh, McDonald's sign looks like, and you have that desire for french fries like I do, that unconditioned stimulus of french fries will elicit an unconditioned response. My stomach will growl, I'm going to feel hungry. Over time, pairing that uh, McDonald's sign with the idea of those fries will elicit that same response over time. And before you know it, I don't even have to see the French fries anymore. All I have to see is those golden arches, and all of a sudden I'm hungry. I know it works with my kids. Every time I drive past one, they automatically feel um, hungry and feel the need to eat something, uh, which is why I tend to feed them before we leave home so they don't ask for anything when we go out. So have you been conditioned? Chances are you have. Uh, do you feel hungry when you see a pizza box or um, you know, anything else that would uh, give you the, the thought of food? It happens to us. And just like Pavlov's dogs, uh, we learn through repeated pairings to associate these neutral stimuli with food. And the sight of a cardboard box or yellow uh, M can be enough to get our stomachs rumbling. Now there's something called stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination. And uh, with stimulus generalization, after association is forged between the conditioned stimulus and the conditioned response, a learner often responds to similar stimuli as if they are the original uh, conditioned response. So what does that mean? Um, if you, let's say you decided to open, um, well, not open. Let me try this one, this example for a change. Let's say um, Wendy's, the food chain, decided to create a symbol that was similar to McDonald's, except their uh, symbol is not the upside down M. Their symbol is now just a W, a yellow W. Okay, so the upside down McDonald's sign. Um, well, maybe they'll get sued. <laughs> But um, let's get, putting all that aside, uh, chances are you're going to generalize that to food and um, crave probably french fries. Now you might look at that Wendy's upside down looking McDonald's symbol and still think or feel for McDonald's fries and that Wendy's fries. Well, that is an idea or an example of stimulus generalization. There's similar stimuli that creates the exact same response. Uh, stimulus discrimination is the ability to differentiate between a particular conditioned stimulus and another significant, uh, significantly different stimuli. Uh, for example, uh, infants can tell the difference between their mother's voice and the voice of other women. And that would be the example of stimulus discrimination. Now, uh, if the conditioned stimulus is presented time and time again without being accompanied by the unconditioned stimulus, the association may fade. This is called extinction. Uh, the conditioned response decreases and eventually disappears. Now, um, after that resting period, if you were to uh, start that pairing process all over again with presentation of a conditioned stimulus, 
the conditioned response may reappear and this reappearance is called spontaneous recovery. There's also something called higher order conditioning. Once a learned association has been made through classical conditioning, the new conditioned stimulus can be used to acquire new learned associations. Here, when a conditioned stimulus, such as a bell that now triggers salivation, is repeatedly paired with a neutral stimulus, such as a flashing light, the dog will learn to salivate in response to the light, without food ever being present. Uh, this is an example of higher order conditioning. These multiple layers of learning help us understand how humans learn associations between many different stimuli. So now uh, we move on to the little Albert exper uh, the little Albert uh, experiment, excuse me. And um, this happened with Watson and Rena in 1920. And when little Albert, um, actually I believe he was nine months old. My slide says an 11 month old, but I have uh, information that says he was nine months. Uh, he participated in this what was considered an ethically questionable experiment with John B. Watson. Okay, so. Um, what would happen is they brought in a, a rat, a white, you know, furry rat, and um, at first the baby wasn't the least bit um, afraid of this rat. But then when they decided to pair that rat with a loud banging sound, um, it created fear in the baby, and then over time, uh, just the sight of the rat alone elicited that uh, same response. So when little Albert heard the loud bang, it was an unconditioned stimulus that elicited fear, uh, the unconditioned response, which is what uh, John B. Watson was trying to uh, create, that uh, unconditioned response of fear. Through conditioning, the sight of the rat became paired with the loud noise, and thus the rat went from being a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus. And uh, little Albert's fear of the rat became a conditioned response. So what does that look like? So before conditioning, rat no fear. Baby's happy playing with the rat. Then there's a loud banging sound, steel bar hit with a hammer. Baby's natural reflex, of course, to that sound is fear. Um, pair that rat with the loud banging sound, and what do you get? After conditioning, you get fear. You get um, the condition reflex of fear after conditioning that rat and pairing it with that loud banging sound. So uh, Watson and Raina observed that fear of white rats generalized to other white and furry objects, a Santa Claus mask, a rabbit, a fur coat. Unfortunately, they lost track of little Albert. They weren't able to, um, uh, you know, I guess bring him some type of comfort knowing that all of these things were uh, you know, they could have reduced his fear. They didn't get the opportunity to, to do that. And um, there's reports that says maybe, you know, he may have grown um, to continue to have this fear even as an adult of some of these things because of what it is they did to this poor child. Uh, would researchers be able to conduct the little Albert experiment today, do you think? Absolutely not. Because of those ethical issues uh, that would arise uh, because of it. Uh, classical conditioning um, examples of accepted responses. Um, I'm going to briefly go over this. Uh, you're looking at advertising as the first one. An automatic response to a celebrity, for example, such as a um, sexual response, heart racing, desire pairing, leads to similar response such as, um, you know, well, other pairings. Um, and I lost my trail of thought there, so I apologize. I have to apologize. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning, so I'm, I'm trying to uh, keep myself going here without getting completely lost. Um, but anyways, uh, what you're looking at here is just pairing of neutral and unconditioned stimuli. Uh, with fears, there's the automatic response to the dog lunging at you as a fear or startle. Um, and then pairing leads to similar response of fear, which is a condition response. Um, condition response where the dog uh, lives. So there's there's a number of things going on here. I'll go ahead and move on. Uh, those are just some examples. Um, Operant conditioning involves learning that occurs when voluntary actions become associated with their consequences. Um, 
So, for example, when it is you give a sea otter or I guess a seal a ball, um, you know, they balance it on their nose, they do what it is uh, they're supposed to do, you give them some type of um, reward. In this case, it's the fish. It works well with children as, as well when it comes to um, providing either consequences or um, providing some type of punishment to either reinforce or stop behavior. So operant conditioning and the law of effect came from Edward Thorndike. And Edward Thorndike conducted cat experiments where over time cats were able to figure out a puzzle box to get to food. They were able to unlatch the box from the inside and um, you know over time with repeated trials uh, they got quicker and quicker at it. So they were able to learn uh, quite effectively. Um, how to get their food. So uh, the law of effect states that behaviors are more likely to reoccur if they are followed by pleasurable outcomes. Uh, things to consider, Thorndike's uh, cats initially discovered the fish treat accidentally. But because they were able to, to discover the fish treat accidentally over time, uh, this behavior was reinforced and they learned to break themselves free from the box. Another behaviorist is uh, Skinner, and um, he was considered a radical behaviorist, and um, Skinner believed that every thought, emotion, and behavior, uh, anything psychological is shaped by factors in the environment, and he created something called the Skinner Box, which looks a lot like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Skinner Box is a chamber that contains a bar, Okay, that an animal can press, usually it's a rat, uh, that can press or manipulate in order to obtain food or water as a type of reinforcement. The Skinner Box also had a device that recorded each response uh, provided by the animal as well as the uh, unique schedule of reinforcement that the animal was assigned. So uh, every five bar presses the animal might get a pellet. If the light came on, um, then the animal should be pressing to get a pellet. Um, if he pressed while the light was off, then he wouldn't get a pellet. So there was some some type of schedule of reinforcement there. He also worked with pigeons um, as well. And um, this is one way that he was able to uh, study observable behavior and the use of reinforcers to, to guide behavior to the acquisition of a desired or complex behavior. Now in terms of acquisition, uh, we've already talked about stimulus generalizations and discrimination. It occurs when previously learned response to one stimulus occurs in the presence of a similar stimulus. And uh, with the use of reinforcers, humans and animals do learn to discriminate. So we've already talked about this. Uh, there is something I did want to cover here, which is there are primary reinforcers and then there are secondary reinforcers. Primary reinforcers satisfy a biological need. Uh, food when hungry, taking medication to stop pain or water when thirsty. Secondary reinforcers are effective through association with primary reinforcers. So um, the light in the Skinner box signals the arrival of food. And then, of course, um, you know, for us it could be money. Um, for kids in school it could be good grades. All of these are, are secondary reinforcers. When it comes to punishment, on the other hand, um, there's puni positive punishment and then there's negative punishment. Uh, with pun positive punishment, and I'm all tongue-tied uh, <laughs> this morning, um, there's an addition of something unpleasant following an unwanted behavior. Uh, receiving a parking ticket, spanking, now it uh, should be noted that there's nothing good uh, about pun positive punishment or anything necessarily bad or terribly bad about negative punishment. It's all just punishment. Um, what we're looking at is positive in terms of adding something and negative in terms of removing something desirable. Um, so negative punishment is taking away something that a child might like. So no more TV, um, no more internet or whatever it is, no more video games. A revoked driver's license because of course we all need our driver's license so to take that away is negative punishment and then of course there's timeouts. Timeouts is the most uh, popular 
form of uh, punishment. Sending a child to a corner for time out is an example of negative punishment because it involves removing something. So the privilege to play, for example, is what it is you're removing. Spanking is also considered a positive punishment um, because it involves the addition of something. So a slap on the bottom to discourage an undesirable behavior. And I should go back and take out also because uh, we're talking about negative versus puni uh, positive punishment here. When it comes to spanking, there's some controversies. About two-thirds of American parents use physical punishment. And spanking often provides a fast action fix, but its consequences may be long-lasting. Um, when it comes to the effects of spanking, research shows that it could be aggression modeled. Um, so uh, kids learn aggression through this method. Uh, the effects of harsh physical discipline uh, is, has been said to be linked to elevated risk for long-term mental health problems, mood, anxiety, and personality disorders. But it's um, very important to note that critics also remind us of this being correlational. And we all know from uh, our early talks in psychology that uh, correlation does not infer causation. So causal inferences are not appropriate when you think about uh, the findings when it comes to spanking. So spanking could work for some parents as well as it might not work for all. Um, I think it's safe to say uh, there's a certain age when you should stop spanking and uh, try other methods uh, such as, as positive and negative reinforcement. Oh, went too far. Let me go back. There we go. So now there's observational learning. Uh, learning by observing others, learning by imitating models, and learning without direct experience. This is called modeling behavior. Uh, it's observing and imitating specific behaviors, and we do it all the time. As a matter of fact, Albert Bandura and his colleagues uh, did this study with a bobo doll, called the classic uh, bobo doll experiment, and um, he had them look at a video of... Um, not a video actually, I believe it was live, where it is he had a researcher beating up a bobo doll and the kids were asked to look at it and um, they responded pretty aggressively when they went to room with this bobo doll. So this brings us to this debate. Does violence in the media um, contribute to aggressive behavior in kids? Well, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, says that extensive research evidence indicates that media violence can contribute to aggressive behavior desensitization to violence, nightmares, and fear of being harmed. Now, this is actual research done. There are critics, though. So what cautions do you, the critics suggest? Um, I'm sure there's tons of research out there. Of course, the debate still exists. This is one of the debates that I have usually in my live class, um, normally in human development. But it is a, a debate that still exists today. So definitely want to think about that. And this brings us to our last slide. Uh, observational learning and cognition. Uh, pro-social behavior and observational learning are, are tied in, they go hand in hand. And the pro-social behavior is demonstrated, for example, by Big Bird and Sesame Street, uh, appear to have a positive effect. Uh, children have a knack for imitating positive behaviors such as sharing and caring. Unfortunately, today, with so much that's on television and on the internet, kids aren't the least bit interested in Sesame Street as were our generations. Um, I grew up on Sesame Street. Sesame Street has been around for years. And interestingly enough, uh, it seems to show when kids are at school. I remember coming home from school and watching Sesame Street. Uh, so I always had access to it. Today, it's not the case. Today, it's if you happen to see it. Um, Children's shows should have intended messages, okay? So they should be looking at very child-appropriate messages on television. Um, it should include pro-social information about people of other cultures and religions. It should be relevant to children in terms of culture and environment. And it should be age-appropriate and contain intentional and direct unhidden messages aimed at educating children about people from different backgrounds. This is what Sesame Street offered. Um, Magic School Bus. I mean, there's a number of them that's out there, even Barney. Um, um, unfortunately, again, with everything that's out there, children are exposed to so much more. They're learning um, more uh, antisocial type behaviors, and they have a lot more attitudes today, if you ask me. 
um, and are not learning the right things on television. So it's safe to say that because we know what violence in the media can do to children, and because we understand that observational learning is so important uh, for children of a young age, we have to monitor what it is they watch. Okay, so this is the end of my uh, Psychology of Learning video. Um, I'm sorry for all the arms and ahs and pauses <laughs> that I give throughout. I try to do these when everyone's asleep at home. Um, so usually that happens after 12 midnight and right now it's 2 o'clock in the morning. So I'm about to call it a night and bring you guys other videos in the next coming days. Um, but as you can tell from the quiet in my background, this is the best time for me to get work done and I absolutely enjoy bringing these videos to you. So I hope you guys are watching it and enjoying it as well.